here everywhere at Christmas. Joy to the world is the message of the season. Joy is the theme of this day. Two weeks ago, we lit the, the prophecy candle and remembered those who spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Last week, we lit the Bethlehem candle, a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. The third candle on the Advent reading is called the Shepherd's Candle. It remembers the first in a long line of people who joyfully shared the good news of the Savior's birth. The third candle that is lit reminds us that our period of waiting is half over. Three candles burning bright, chasing away the darkness from light. Three candles glowing bright, the blessing of God giving you sight. The scripture is from Luke chapter 2. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy in all people. To you is born this day the city of David, the Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This, is, this will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped in brands of cloth, lying in the future. And suddenly there will be an angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, deep among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd told them. Let us pray. Dear God, with joy and praise, we acknowledge the Son of Science and your
And John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so the crowds asked him, What then should we do? And in reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. And soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. And as the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming, and I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Amen. I was reading an article in um, the paper this past week about yoga. It is a yoga routine of two deep breathing exercises and 26 ordered poses carried out in a room that is 105 degrees. And not only that, it's carried out with high humidity, about 60 to 70 percent Humidity. It's called Bikram Yoga. I don't know, have any of you heard this before? Bikram Yoga is growing. It's growing in the Twin Cities and across the nation. And uh, recently, the members of the Today Show, uh, they did a segment on Bikram Yoga. True believers, I guess, are true believers. They credit Bikram Yoga with weight loss and increased flexibility and energy growth and feeling young and all of those other wonderful things. And I thought to myself, I should take up Bikram Yoga, I think. How about you? Let's start a group in the church, shall we? I mean, who would want those things? Flexibility, increased flexibility, Revitalize energy, we get to feel a little, little younger, you know, those are wonderful things. So they found a way for that through yoga. And the week before I saw a news report on this a wonderful program involving injections, and maybe you've heard about this before, injections of this or that uh, uh, medication, and uh, it also included some exercise and a diet, and then if you did all these things, which, by the way, cost only $15,000 a year, that's all, fifteen grand a year, uh, and if you did all these things, it would be like finding the fountain of youth. Wouldn't that be great? Huh? Wouldn't that be wonderful? There's this one and that one's miracle diet program. You know, you eat this way and watch the pounds fall off magically or, or take a pill and it reduces the size of, you know, your appetite just 
miraculously and uh, you lose all this weight and, and you won't be ashamed to go out of the house anymore as, as if it ever occurred to you to be ashamed to go out of your house in the first place. Then there's Dr. Phil. How many of you watched Dr. Phil in the afternoon? Well, none of you? Well, you know, I'm not talking about uh, Dr. Phil Moss either, by the way. <laughs> I'm talking about, I don't even know what Dr. Phil's last name is. This is Dr. Phil, right? He's got his program, you know, with the, that daily program designed to solve all of your relationship problems and psychological hang-ups, uh, you know, and if you don't listen to Dr. Phil, then I guess you've got Dr. Oz, right? And, and if you don't have Dr. Oz, then you've got Martha Stewart, and you've got uh, all of the people on HGTV that will teach you how to get your house, you know, in good order and make everything beautiful and, and your life, of course, right along with your home. Then there's Susie Orman who can help you figure out your finances, all those people who are on TV in the wee small hours of the morning with those exercise gizmos and those money making schemes and those wonder drugs that all you have to do is buy this product or that product and life will be bright for you. Life will be good for you. It'll be terrific for you. Which is not to mention all those products and advertisements, all those things that you just have to have. And once you've got them, then your life will be happy and you'll be healthy and you'll be beautiful and handsome and wealthy and look great and you'll feel marvelously and you'll dance gracefully. All of these things around us. Nor is it to mention the folks whose faces are so nauseatingly familiar to us. The ones who promise that if you elect them in this next uh, election, then this nation and this world will finally be sane again. And that society would work right, the sun will shine on America in particular. I'm the man or I'm the woman to get the job done right. You hear this all the time. I'll make things right and you can count on me. So you think of them and you think of all of these things that surround us in our daily lives, and you realize why old John the Baptizer was such an oddball that we read about in the Gospel lesson. I mean, it wasn't just his clothes or his diet or his in-your-face preaching style. It was that John the Baptist started out by saying, I am not the Messiah. You're looking for a Savior, but I'm not the Savior. You're looking for one, it ain't me. I can't promise you happiness. I can't promise that your life will be wonderful and that you'll be beautiful or that you'll be younger. I can't give you everything that you want in your life. I'm just the warm-up act. Screaming myself, blue in the face, trying to get you to wake up to what God is up to right here and right now in your life. This is John the Baptist. I think in a world filled to the brim with would-be messiahs and wonder products and miracle cures, John was very straightforward in saying he wasn't it. He was not the man. He was not the miracle worker. He was not the answer to all of life's problems, and in particular, your problems in life. Hats off to John for knowing who he was and who he wasn't. Would-be messiahs around us are a dime a dozen. Messiah wannabes are quick to push themselves forward. And so every day we are bombarded by voices calling out for our attention. Voices that make extravagant
promises about all they will do for us. And we are tempted to believe in these things. We are tempted, but they cannot fulfill the things that they promise to do. You see, John the baptizer doesn't do any of this. He's an ironic character. He preaches loudly and boldly, and throngs of people come out to hear him. But once he has their attention, he tells them that he isn't the one that they're looking for. He isn't it. And that his sole purpose for being is to point them to the one who is the Messiah, to direct them to the Savior, their Savior, their answer, who is Jesus, the one who was and is the answer, the one and only Messiah. All these folks making extravagant promises, they can't deliver. They can't deliver what they promise. There's nothing wrong with them. Vikram, yoga certainly might make you feel better. Let's try it, shall we? Let's just try it together and see what might happen. I've got nothing against yoga. It might even make you feel healthier. And who wouldn't want to be healthier? Dr. Phil seems like a sensible guy, and I'm sure there are healthy dietary plans and reputable ways to make money around. And there is nothing wrong with enjoying the things that you have. I enjoy things that I have. I enjoy driving my car. I enjoy watching my television. And I have a nice TV. There's nothing wrong with enjoying these things. But they can't make life right. And if you think they can, then you are seriously mistaken. You can't look to your possessions to make your life right. You can't look to exercise plans or yoga to make your life right. You can't even look to John the Baptist to make your life right. There is only one thing that will ever make your life right, and that is the one for whom John the Baptist proclaims, Jesus the Messiah. Nothing out there except the only Messiah there has ever been Jesus Christ, son of Mary and Joseph, and son of God. He is the one who came and lived and died for us, that we might live for him now. Live lives marked by love and forgiveness. Live lives marked with generosity and cheerfulness and service and sacrifice. So in the end, by giving it all up, we get it all back, and then some. This is Jesus, the Messiah, the one that we follow. So Christmas is the season of moving from cruelty, and, and don't we see a lot of cruelty in the world today? Christmas is the season of moving from cruelty to a cure. It is the season, Christmas is the season of moving from grasping to giving. This is Christmas. Nothing new, nothing trendy, nothing flashy, nothing we find on our televisions at 3 a.m. in the morning. Just the old, old story of Jesus and Jesus' love. And all the church can do as the people of God is just to keep telling and living out that old, old story of Jesus and his love. Just keep telling it over 
over and over again. Keep inviting people to be part of this Jesus story, to be part of this Jesus movement. The way we tell it might change. The images, the words, the music, they change, but the message, the message never changes. You know, now we're getting seriously down to the Christmas season, aren't we? I mean, we got the Christmas, children's Christmas program later on this morning. I mean, we're getting seriously down to the Christmas season. Radio stations are broadcasting Christmas music. Christmas decorations and lights and wrapping paper and bows have been out since, I think, before Halloween, right? I mean, they've been out for a long time. And all the other activities we associate with Christmas, they are all in full swing, and we're all busy people. The advertising for Christmas goodies is relentless, and many preachers, I think, will stand up, and they will talk about how awful this is, because we're in the Advent season, right? We're in the Advent season. We're not in the Christmas season yet. But I confess to you that I love this time of year. I simply love this time of year. I love all the extra stuff that comes to the fore in December. But it's also important to me to remember that most of this stuff is extra stuff. It's extra stuff. It's the icing, not the cake. That it's not the heart of Christmas. Because Christmas is about Jesus. Christmas is about God's love come to earth, come to us, come to you in this Jesus. Christmas is about the hope we have, a hope that will never go away. Christmas is about peace on earth and goodwill to all people. Christmas is not about John. Christmas is about what John's finger is pointing at, Jesus. And as we gather around the altar this morning, may our eyes be on this prize. May our eyes and our hearts be on this Jesus. John was right. He was not and is not the Messiah. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus will be. Amen. Let's stand together as we confess our faith.